Fans of the hit TV show Scandal can now revisit every episode on Unpacking the Toolbox, a Scandal Rewatch podcast, hosted by the cast members behind Quinn Perkins and Huck. So, gladiators, grab some Gettysburger and relive Scandal's most iconic OMG moments. We would be in like 110 degrees in a wool coat. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. chafing that was going on in my pencil skirts. <laughs> I deserve all the acting awards, people. Listen to Unpacking the Toolbox, a Scandal Rewatch podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Alphabet Boys is a new podcast series that goes inside undercover investigations. In the first season, we're diving into an FBI investigation of the 2020 protests. It involves a cigar-smoking mystery man who drives a silver hearse. And inside this hearse was like a lot of guns. But are federal agents catching bad guys or creating them? He was just waiting for me to set the date, the time, and then for sure he was trying to get it to happen. Listen to Alphabet Boys on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know Lance Bass is a Russian-trained astronaut? That he went through training in a secret facility outside Moscow, hoping to become the youngest person to go to space? Well, I ought to know, because I'm Lance Bass. And I'm hosting a new podcast that tells my crazy story and an even crazier story about a Russian astronaut who found himself stuck in space with no country to bring him down. With the Soviet Union collapsing around him, he orbited the Earth for 313 days that changed the world. Listen to The Last Soviet on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'd been in the job for about maybe three months, and I'm checking the trains for open doors. Then I see these three guys there, and they're getting their stuff ready to jump out. I go around, and I'm waiting for them. So when they jump out, they jump out right by where the rescue mission is. As soon as I told them to come over here, they, they all pull out their knives all pissed off. And then I just tell them to stay right there, and then uh, I just pull my weapon. I'm speaking with Joe Duarte about working as a railroad security guard, where standoffs were part of his daily life. But it wasn't his job to fight armed hobos, so Joe called for backup. I knew the guys were at the Circle K, which is half a mile away. I have my radio, and I'm talking into it. Uh, I got these guys, they have knives. There's three of them, and I'm right by where you guys are at. And they're not listening to me. The guys Joe called were rail cops. It's their job to protect the trains and the cargo which means dealing with people who aren't supposed to be in the yard. But without backup, the hobos weren't scared of Joe. They outnumbered him three to one. And I tell him, bro, put those down, I'm gonna shoot you. They're like, yeah, shoot us. Mr. Security Guard ran a cop, and I'm calling it again. Finally, one of the rail cops answered. No, Joe, just let him go. And I go, no, they pulled a knife on me, man. But the cops just laughed him off. Joe realized he was on his own. I see the dust cloud. He does the other turn, and I couldn't tell at first if it was one of our units, if it was Border Patrol. Then I see the damn Camaro. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Was that his backup? If it was, Joe'd be surprised. In the five months he'd been working for the Union Pacific Railroad Police, they hadn't come to his rescue once. But who were the rail cops? I was shocked when I learned about how this private security force, with full local, state, and federal police powers, reports only to the railroads. And Joe's part of the country is the perfect place to see what rail cops are all about. So we're in El Paso, where the edge of the country meets the edge of the train yard. With tracks running along the border with Mexico, El Paso is a crossroads for everyone. And in the middle of all of this are the rail cops. I imagine Ruby and her friends crossing through El Paso as they headed east from Los Angeles to New Orleans on the Sunset Route. What happens to hobos who get off in this wild territory, where they more at risk on land controlled by the rail cops? Maybe it was more dangerous there. After all, hobos had written songs about how rough it was when you got to Texas. So in the train yards of a border town, is anyone really in charge? I'm Danelle Morton, and this is City of the Rails. Where will you go if your hole won't hide? 
is broke. As soon as I heard about the rail cops, I wanted to know more about the people who police the city of the rails. It sounds so unbelievable to say that the nation's railroads have their own police who can pretty much do whatever they want. Imagine another industry with this kind of muscle, like, say, Facebook, Google, or Big Pharma, had their own legal militia who could arrest you. That's what you have with the rail cops. It's real, real, real easy, especially, I mean, we're now... Which is how I ended up in Texas with Joe, taking me around to places he used to patrol. Right over there? That's called the Roundhouse. There's a thing where they turn the trains around. El Paso is the western edge of Texas, on the border of New Mexico. It's a scrubby Old West desert town in a basin between tall, dark mountains. This town is a hotbed of activity, making it the best place to see how rail cops fit into the city of the rails. It's just weird. Oh, there's another place I'm going to take you to. Union Pacific hired Joe to do the job that rail cops don't want to do, get to know the hobos. Joe spent five years on the job, but before Union Pacific contracted him, Joe was just a bouncer. I had no security experience, no railroad experience. I just had experience throwing guys out of bars and venues. Joe didn't have much experience, and after some training on rail safety, the rail cops sort of plunked Joe down in the train yard with his phone and a notepad and left him to figure it out for himself. And there was a lot to learn. The rail cops' main job is to protect the trains and to nab cargo thieves, but it gets more complicated in El Paso. The area has always been an international crossroads and for more than a century, a freight hub. Trains go north and south to and from factories on the Mexican side of the border, and they head east from California with goods from China. That means that every week, 438 trains come through El Paso on 535 miles of track that connect the city's six rail yards, and four million pedestrians cross over the bridges that span the Rio Grande. And with so much movement, Joe had to make sense of it all and get a feel for all the different types of people the trains brought into the yard. There were the hobos that were just regular travelers. So those guys were real cool. Like, they mostly want to be to themselves. And then there were, there were the gangs, and then there were the drug ones. Those guys were in the shadows. They did everything at night. And they were, they were hidden everywhere. They scared everybody. That's the one thing about El Paso, that you can score anything real easy. If you're a hobo, it's easy for you for to score some ice, some coke, some marijuana. Easy. Nobody's going to, you know, you ask those guys, hey, man. The trains make opportunities for everyone at the border, making El Paso a huge hotspot for train robbers. So in the day-to-day, hobos are low on a rail cop's priority list. That's why they brought in Joe. Joe's main priority was to interview the travelers he found in the yard, get their names, take pictures and personal details to add to Union Pacific's trespasser database, leave the bigger stuff to the rail cops. Joe got to know the hobos in the yard so well, he knew who to ask for traveling advice. One time, I caught this three-piece band trying to get to Denver. They had that big old bass. So I'm like... What are you trying to do, you idiot? I can see that bass from everywhere. <laughs> so finally, I'm like, let me talk to a conductor. I go, which train is going to Denver, man? Because these guys are going to end up dead in the desert, man. They don't even have enough water. And then uh, he goes, you know what? You're better off talking to the hobos because they'll, they'll get them on the right train. The hobos knew the schedule really quick. So Joe found an older rider who knew just what to do. Yeah, bro, I'm going to go that way. Tell them to go with me. But they're going to need six gallons of water, and they're going to need uh, enough food for two days or whatever. But it was a three. I had caught them that day four times. What about they kept getting on the wrong train, and you kept finding them? On like the a- same day. Joe had a lot to keep track of. Lost musicians, hobos, smugglers, cargo thieves. The list goes on. People stuck through the yard for all sorts of reasons. So the river's right there, and there's some tunnels that run right across, and the rescue mission was located right there. So what would happen, a lot of residents from Mexico would come in to eat at the rescue mission because they offered three meals. The rescue mission of El Paso is right by the train yard. Every serious tramp has gotten a free meal at its corner of Hope, where they also can get clothes and a shower. And these services are useful to locals from Juarez, too. With all these people moving through the yard, Joe never knew what to expect when he showed up for work. All of a sudden, you're in another, like in another feeling. 
Sometimes it was fear. Sometimes it was happiness. Sometimes it was even sadness. Sometimes you, you, you feel sorry for these guys. You'd be like, man, you know, something bad had to happen for these guys to, to be here. But it was always different. It was never the same old, the same old crap, no. But despite all the things Joe faced in the yard, he wasn't getting much respect from the rail cops. They wouldn't even respond to his calls for backup. Joe was eager to show he was capable of more. So he was excited when the rail cops called him in to give him a very important job. They're in the office and they go, Joe, we got a job for you. We got a special shipment, we need you to find it. You need you to look at all the yards, especially the one by the bridge. Joe was honored. Tracking cargo was important and he took it seriously. So they give me a paper and goes, okay, this is a special shipment of uh, sailboat fuel, okay? Yes, sir. Very special, man. I said, man, is this explosive? I think it is, man. So be careful, man. Don't, you don't smoke? Ah, oh, I don't smoke, man. Got the perfect guy for it. Joe went from yard to yard searching for this shipment. He even got a Border Patrol agent to help him look. We're looking at everything. We can't find it. And I was out there all day, and I'm like, God, please help me find this. Help me find this shipment of sailboat. I'll look so good if I find it. And then it dawned on Joe. Sailboats don't need fuel. It's air, the shipment of air. Sons of bitches, I'm like, man. <laughs> so these guys were just screwing with you. Exactly. They were like, ha ha, we're gonna get yeah. the security guard. Joe was working hard, walking the tracks and checking the trains while these guys not only ignored him, but wasted his time and just hung out at the Circle K. And Joe's story squared with what hobos told me. Real cops could do whatever they wanted. Beat you up, strand you in the desert, you name it. So what was up with that? What makes these guys able to do whatever they want? It all ties back to the unique status of the rail cops. Their power is written into law and has been that way for more than 100 years. When the Civil War ended in 1865, the United States was subsidizing the rails willy-nilly, laying track in all directions as a way of boosting the economy. The railroads were carving up the landscape, infuriating the indigenous people as they destroyed their land and killed off the buffalo. When tribes attacked railroad construction crews, Washington sent the U.S. Army to protect the workers building the Transcontinental Railroad. But when the Transcontinental was completed in 1869, the Army went home. There was no force to protect the railroads from thieves inside the cars or raiders from without. So the government allowed the states and the territories to charter the railroad police as a private security force with full police powers, nationwide, along 140,000 miles of track, supervised only by the railroads. Now you might think permission to operate outside the law sounds like an exaggeration. How could that be possible? It's one of those crazy legacy railroad things established in the 19th century, when at the time the West was mostly territories with very few states. The government-sanctioned rail cops were left up to the railroads to manage, and even after one by one, Arizona and Nevada and the rest were brought into the United States, no one remembered to make the railroad police just like other security guards. Railroad police are not subject to government oversight. And what does that mean? It means railroads don't have to answer public record requests, so we don't know how many people the rail cops arrest, under what circumstances, and what kind of altercations take place in the yard. I guess if you're thinking about this in the gentlest way possible, and I'm not, you could say, why should this be a cause for alarm? The rail cops have a job to do, and mostly it's confined to the yard. And when something big happens, they always interact with the local cops to jail the bad guys. Well, cops with no rules is never a good idea. Just look how it played out for Joe. In a job where he could get knives pulled on him, he likely wouldn't get backup from his team. This had a major impact on Joe. As Joe walked his beat, he interviewed riders and other trespassers, took notes and photographs, and filed them in the rail cops database. These reports were something everyone was supposed to be filing, but not everyone did. Everybody was doing the work except the railroad police. I don't know why. Every morning, I would hand out the field inspection reports to all of them, because if not, they were going to get written up for that. And it, it was like, Joe, can I have five? Can I, I need at least seven today and this and that. So you're saying you would stop trespassers and you would write them up 
and that the other railroad police would come to you and go, could I have some of your reports and I could file them as my own? Exactly. Joe began to realize those rail cops weren't worthy of his respect. As the months went on, he started to believe it might be worse than them just being lazy with plenty of time on their hands to pull pranks. They were all supposed to be protecting cargo, but sometimes the guys would tell Joe not to patrol one of the train yards on a specific day. Sometimes they'd tell me to stay away from certain trains that were coming in. We got those trains, don't worry about them. And I'm not a cop or, or nothing like that, but I'm not dumb either. You know, why, well, why would you have me stay away from them or have my guys stay away from that? I'd be suspicious too. When Joe was hired, it was to replace guards who'd been robbing the trains in the rail yard right under the bull's noses. I wanted to find out if there was any proof of Joe's suspicions, so I scoured court filings and legal databases looking for rail cops convicted in smuggling cases, but could find none. Were the rail cops squeaky clean, or was there no one reporting? So on the day those three hobos pulled knives on Joe, he knew his backup wasn't coming. The bulls told Joe to let the hobos go, but they'd already drawn their weapons, and so had Joe. And then Joe saw that cloud of dust and the car racing toward him. What the hell was that? It sure didn't look like backup. Cops didn't drive that kind of car. All of a sudden comes this Camaro. It's red. It's it's a beautiful car, man. Beautiful, beautiful car. He gets off and I'm like, what the hell? He's wearing this weird shirt. Uh, what's that movie, uh, Ocean's Eleven, where uh, t- hey, t- Ted Ninja Nugent call? called? He wants his shirt back. Joe had never seen this guy before, but right away, he took charge of the situation. It blew my mind. He talked to him real stern in their lingo, whatever, and they knew he hey, he's a bull. And I was like, a bull? It's the first time I heard that. He talked in their language, and he basically told them to throw their knives and walk away, and he was going to let them go. And, and, you know, and to respect me, they kind of looked at him and they were watching and like, whoa, something's up. They got this guy here now. I'm like, oh, wow, man. And then he, he goes and picks up the knives and uh, puts them in a bag. And he comes and shakes my hand and he's like, I'm Larry Diaz and I'm with organized crime. And this Miami Vice entrance hadn't made it clear enough. Things were about to change in Joe's life. Joe told Larry he was frustrated by how few arrests there were in the yard. And as a security guard, he couldn't do anything about it. I go, these guys are running our trains, and nobody does nothing to them. And they just talk like shit to us, and this and that, and nothing happens, man. And he goes, where's your backup? And I go, got the Circle K looking at nudie magazines. And he goes, things are going to change from now on. And then he told me, one thing, Joe, don't trust none of these guys, not one of them. You mean none of the trespassers, none of the people who no, were walking No, none of the, the officers. The guy in the Camaro, Union Pacific Special Agent Larry Diaz, was right. Things were about to change for Joe and for the El Paso rail cops. This was the beginning of a dynamic duo. Larry meets Joe as Batman meets Robin, Sherlock and Watson, partners in crime fighting with complementary skills. Yes, it was a mess, pure chaos at the border. But together, Larry and Joe, they were going to take it on. During the summer of 2020, some Americans suspected that the FBI had secretly infiltrated the racial justice demonstrations. And you know what? They were right. I'm Trevor Aronson, and I'm hosting a new podcast series, Alphabet Boys. As the FBI, sometimes you got to grab the little guy to go after the big guy. Each season will take you inside an undercover investigation. In the first season of Alphabet Boys, we're revealing how the FBI spied on protesters in Denver. At the center of this story is a raspy-voiced, cigar-smoking man who drives a silver hearse. And inside this hearse was like a lot of guns. He's a shark. And not in the good, badass way. He's a, a nasty shark. He was just waiting for me to set the date, the time, and then for sure he was trying to get it to happen. Listen to Alphabet Boys on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, 
or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lance Bass, and you may know me from a little band called NSYNC. What you may not know is that when I was 23, I traveled to Moscow to train to become the youngest person to go to space. And when I was there, as you can imagine, I heard some pretty wild stories. But there was this one that really stuck with me about a Soviet astronaut who found himself stuck in space with no country to bring him down. It's 1991, and that man, Sergei Krekalev, is floating in orbit when he gets a message that down on Earth, his beloved country, the Soviet Union, is falling apart. And now he's left defending the Union's last outpost. This is the crazy story of the 313 days he spent in space. 313 days that changed the world. Listen to The Last Soviet on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's 1967, the Cold War, and Joseph Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, the princess of the Kremlin, has just fled Mother Russia. Her new home? A place where the roads are paved with gold and people bake apple pies out of baseballs and freedom. A place called America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone would be worthy of a podcast. But this one, Svetlana Svetlana, is about what comes next. And it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, mystics, and a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, destiny, immortality, and unbreakable cycles, weird sex stuff, weird money stuff, weird dances, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright who won't shut up about it all. Guess which one I am? Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Working together, everything was about to change for Joe and Larry. With Larry around, Joe didn't have to worry about backup. And the two had bigger plans. They were taking on cargo theft. Larry had been transferred from L.A. by Union Pacific to crack down on the thefts in and around the El Paso yard. And when he met Joe, Larry was just starting to understand how complex the problem was in West Texas. In some ways, it was like L.A., but being so close to the border meant everything was much more complicated. Soon, Larry would teach Joe how to handle showdowns with hobos, and the two of them would focus on tapping into the hobo network. Joe and Larry brought different skills to this, which was reflected in the way they look. Larry is medium height, with his salt and pepper black hair pulled into a ponytail, and a mustache and goatee framing his face. He's muscular and energetic, someone whose intense eyes you can feel, even when he's wearing his aviator sunglasses. Joe is larger, chunky in frame, but with a sweetness about him you can hear in his voice. These guys seem like good cops, not like the bulls hobos described who had nicknames like Satan and Hitler. Those were the ones who scared me when I thought about Ruby in the yard. How did rail cops treat young women travelers they found on the trains? And what could they tell me about Ruby? That was one of the first questions I asked when I met Larry Diaz. Like if you would see somebody about my daughter's age, I mean, would you treat a young girl differently? When I saw females, I gave them a lot of attention, not just because they're females, but because they're vulnerable. But you know what? These chicks were as tough as nails. They were, they knew the game. They knew that they had the attitude and they were not afraid. Ruby was tougher now. Those months on the rails had made their mark. Larry told me how female writers depended on that strength while writing. I never met a female train rider that was like timid or scared, unless it was like some of you just jumped on the train and was running away from home and doing, they had no clue. And I ran into those, and of course those got my full attention. What if she wasn't with a train family? There were a lot of scary men on the rails who traveled in packs and picked up young women who needed protection. If she fell in with those characters, would that change her prospects? I consider that group thinking, okay, so how is she an asset for us? She could go beg for us, or maybe she'll go steal some liquor. So if your daughter had the ability to be a part of this team, even if she was just a funny girl, these guys are living this rough life by choice. That's her value. I mean, it could be anything. Larry knew this how? 
My experience was that hobos mostly didn't want to talk to me, and they'd be even less likely to talk to a cop. But the alliances people made in the train yard were always up for negotiation, and Larry was in a position to strike a bargain if he thought he could get some useful information. Hobos could be good informants. Most of them don't rob trains. They don't have much use for a big screen TV and a boxcar. But they are likely to have seen the people who swarmed the yard, broke up in a container, and made off with the laptops. Guess what? These guys know the railroad, and they know the railroad schedule, and they know the routes and everything about the trains better than even the railroad cops. If the people who rode the train had that much intel, Larry would try to turn them into informants. And that's where Joe came in. Larry took Joe under his wing, showing him how the trespasser information he was already gathering could be a big help to Larry. Joe's familiarity with hobos, the photos and bios he'd logged on his phone, could be where Larry started his investigations. So Larry set him to work turning hobos into informants. Joe did a phenomenal job going actually and finding sources for me. I go, these, this is what I want from the guys. Ask them these questions. Do you know about railroad crime. Oh my God, you're, you ride trains? What have you seen? And where do you ride at? What do you see? These questions were a way to start testing out how much a hobo knew. Larry also taught Joe how to take advantage of catching hobos who had outstanding warrants for their arrest. But this wasn't as easy as walking up to a hobo, asking them a couple of questions. A hobo didn't want it to get around that he was working with the cops, so they would only agree if they could do their business in secret. Joe had a whole strategy for this approach. Give me something to work with, and you tell me, you know what, these guys are doing this, this guy's... Nobody's going to know you're telling me this, and we're going to use you as a source, and I'm going to make sure my guys don't mess with you. You're always going to have water, you know, and I'm always going to give you a right to the rescue mission. After meeting Larry, Joe had an eye out for the kind of traveler who could be a good source. But that was only part of what made Joe effective. Joe's genuine manner and open-hearted approach was, in part, thanks to his boss, T.J. Munson. He took care of me... Like, he gave me a chance in my life to be something I always wanted to be, a cop. TJ's magical, man. He's, he's John Wayne, man. In El Paso, I got to meet TJ. He's retired now and extremely proud of the decades he spent as a rail cop. It was part of his family's tradition. His dad had been a bull, and TJ grew up in a small railroad town in Nevada. He watched his dad interact with travelers, and sometimes TJ worked alongside them in the garden. The old boy went over to my dad, and I followed along, you know. And he said, uh, sir, he said, uh, anyway, I could talk you out of getting a little grub. And my dad said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you work for me today, help us out. He said, I'll give you some money, and I'll give you some grub. TJ heard their stories and got to know the people his dad called old boys. And TJ instructed his force to see old boys as people to treat them with kindness. You know, one thing I told my guys when I hired them, if you ask an old boy, what's your occupation? And he tells you doctor, write doctor down because he's probably a doctor. He's had a bad time somewhere. His wife has left him. He's gotten into the bottle. Something has happened to where he just took off, you know? and he's riding the rails. So TJ wanted his guys on the force to grant the hobos human dignity, and it was the same decency and humor TJ brought to his work at the border. He was amused by the chaos, and with four decades on the job, he had a lot of funny stories. Patting down a guy one time, and I'm scared to death of snakes, and every pocket I touched moved. I jumped back, and I said, man, what do you got in that pocket? (laughs) He had a bunch of birds. He had birds in all of his pockets. They were parakeets. Yeah. I mean, you know, go figure. I mean, mean, who the hell does that but somebody that rides a train, I guess. I don't know, you know. That compassion Joe learned from TJ came in handy at the border. He interacted with so many different kinds of people and still approached every traveler with understanding. He could appreciate how difficult life had been for some of them. These guys have been through so much stuff, you know. That's why TJ would always tell me, all they need is a little love, Joe, just like the song, all you need is love. And that was very important in what I did, man. 
Mostly Joe approached people softly, with curiosity and compassion at first. He recalled a time when a distraught man he found in the yard became one of Larry's best informants. When Joe found him, the hobo was racked with guilt about the mess he'd made of his life. It's because I've been doing some bad stuff, bro. You're never going to understand. Hey, come on, go. You like McDonald's? He goes, yeah. I haven't had McDonald's in a long time, bro. So I take him to McDonald's right there. and then he's... Over lunch, Joe found out his guest knew a lot. Joe called Larry. And I told Tito, this guy, he says he knows about smuggling and all that. He goes, just keep him there. I go, bro, he's going to stay here, man. He's, he's loving every drink and this and that. And... Joe kept the guy there till Larry showed up. And in the end, he gave them valuable information about drug smuggling in the area. He's the one who told me about coming across with loads of dope, and he had done it himself. They put the narcotics in a backpack about three rail cars away, in front of them usually, or behind them, and then they ride with the load to Chicago or whatever. In El Paso, through Larry and Joe, my eyes were open to just how many different criminals used the rails to do their business. I didn't expect Ruby to be riding alongside potential narcotics traffickers. I asked Joe if young women were ever informants, but Joe said the one time he caught young women in the yard, what they were expecting shocked him. I pulled them off the train, and then I, I just told them to stand by my vehicle, and I was getting all their stuff, and then she's like, so what, are you going to fuck us right now, or what? Are you going to take us somewhere? And I go, fuck you right now? What are you talking about? I go, no, I'm going to take you to a rescue mission. She guys could get a shower and, and eat something. And then uh, she goes, well, it's because we're so used to getting abused and hit and, and raped. And I go, well, what are you doing here in the first place? And then she's like, you probably won't understand. Had Ruby ever faced this? I wondered how common it was. My guess was not very. Although young women travelers had told me stories about angry cops taking their packs as evidence or patting them down in a sexual manner, I'd never heard a story like the one Joe told. Still, considering how much leeway cops had, it wasn't outside the realm of possibility. What I found out about the rails is the, there's different levels of evilness, right? If you want to, to play with the devil, you're going to find them there in the rail yard. And that's where they catch their prey. So this was the Batman Robin Balance in action. Joe was the quieter guy, the one on the scene, who patrolled the tracks. Meanwhile, Larry worked the streets, and because Larry had more power than other cops, his mission to fight cargo theft had no bounds. Which was a good thing for Larry for many reasons. For one, Larry is the aggressive type, wily and confrontational, someone who stood out among the other cops and enjoyed that. When he showed up in El Paso, he didn't mind provoking people, like with his taste in music. When Larry was a teenager, he discovered Jimi Hendrix. Jimi showed him another world was possible, more than what he saw in his neighborhood. And I prayed to Jimi Hendrix every morning. Larry brought his super fandom with him to the Union Pacific Rail Cop offices, where he built a little shrine to Hendrix. A lot of other cops didn't like that. And in this macho crowd, a confrontation was inevitable. And every time Larry describes a confrontation with authority, it feels like we're in a scene from a Lethal Weapon movie. Now remember the captain telling you take that shit off the wall. You said, "Motherfucker, that's God. Don't you fuck with my God." And they were everybody. Everybody's got guns and shit, and you're like fucking screaming at them. That's God, motherfucker. And you, and you, and everyone's like, "What the fuck is going on here?" Larry brought this same determination with him on the beat. So while Joe moved through the yard trying to find hobos who could tell him something about cargo theft, Larry moved outside it. He worked the streets, even the local swap meets, to get intel on cargo thieves. They had this place called the Tiradero. It was a sanctioned swap meet in downtown El Paso. And I would look at this place, and this is a fucking gold mine. And so I went in there, and I would see these boxes and cases of stuff stacked up. Nikes and blenders and VCRs. Why, are the, why do these poor people have this shit? They would take like four or five boxes or whatever, stuff that they had just stolen off the train the night before. Ooh. And then you could say, hey, dude, I'm going to open a store over here on El Paso, dude. How many of these can you get? I'll buy this one right here. How many can you get, bro? Oh, I got fucking 300 of those. Oh, okay, man, we're missing 300 of these motherfuckers. You see how this works, bro? I do, Larry, but only because you explained it to me. Cargo theft was a seemingly unsolvable puzzle with a million pieces of it scattered all over the border. It took a special kind of mind to put those pieces together. And Larry, he came to this as his birthright. 
Larry was raised in a working-class neighborhood in Whittier, California, 20 miles southeast of Los Angeles. His parents immigrated from Mexico before Larry was born, in Hollywood, and both worked several jobs to support the family. Before he finished elementary school, he joined a gang, and it wasn't long before he and a whole gang got in trouble with the law. So in sixth grade, I got arrested. Uh, with 19 of us got arrested, we had broken into my own school. This gang vandalized his elementary school and did some real damage. And this arrest was a turning point for Larry. Sitting on a bench in the sheriff's station, Larry got a good look at the detectives and admired their style. I remember them very clearly, like, cussing. Um, they had their guns exposed. They had, like, T-shirts on, their guns out, their badge and their handcuffs tucked around their their belt, and you, you, I just liked the way that looked. In addition to that, they were like pushing each other, saying, hey, fuck you, and they're like, you know, they were like friends, the same stuff that we did in the street. And I said, hmm, this is like a, this is like a gang right here. And look, at they've got guns. So Larry left the gang and enrolled in the Sheriff's Academy. And shortly after he graduated, he was recruited by Union Pacific to become a rail cop. Larry was intrigued. As a kid, trains had run right behind his house, and he and his gang sometimes broke into them to steal cases of beer. He was still fascinated by trains, and this job offered even more money. So Larry applied to the railroad police. And in that uniquely Larry way, he decided not to hide his gang past when he was interviewed by the railroad. He bragged about it. And guess what? I know how to hop those trains. They're going, what? I know how to pull the air and make the train stop. They're like, what? And somehow you think this is a good thing to be telling us? Fucking qualified, bro. I'm better qualified than anybody you know. Larry got hired, and when he started, he didn't know the full story of the rail cops. On his first day, his training officer explained, absolute impunity came with the job. He goes, everything you learned in the Sheriff Academy, forget it. This is a whole different world. That's all garbage. This is different. This is the railroad police. They mean that they don't have to follow certain rules? Exactly. They make their own. This is how we operate here. We're bulls. We have the power, federal and state. We do what we want. We're in control. FBI, they can't stop a car and give them a ticket for going through a red light. We can. We give tickets, too. LAPD can't go to the U.S. Attorney's Office and file a case. We can. We're feds, too. We got both. And there's no public scrutiny. Thank you. None. You are a lawless police force. Well, we had some guidelines. But they're not mandatory. They were mandatory, but did we follow them? Who was going to keep our feet to the fire on that? After seeing how Joe got treated by his co-workers, their lack of effort should be no surprise. I mean, why do too much if no one's really watching? But guys like Joe and Larry, they were different. Larry believes he was one of the first Hispanic men hired as a Union Pacific rail cop back in the 1980s. And the rail cop bosses told him straight out that he was a diversity hire and they'd be happy to see him quit. This put a chip on Larry's shoulder. He would show them he'd work harder and smarter than anyone else. More arrests, stop more cargo theft. Using these broad police powers in a world where there were few boundaries, Larry saw the possibilities. He could become a legend, and he did. Union Pacific recognized his skills could help handle the growing cargo theft problem in El Paso. Assembling the pieces of this puzzle brought him to the slopes of Mount Cristo Rey. And that's where you see how all of this happened. And I know these mountains like the back of my hand because we used to walk up here all the time and set up surveillances on the U.S. side. After gathering information about robbers, Larry knew how the thieves thought. He could see their trucks parked on the other side of the border, a sure sign a raid was on the horizon. This is obviously Mexico. We're like, what, 50 feet from the border? Mm -hmm. So this was a real hard area to contain. The spot Larry's showing me is one of the most dangerous and desperate neighborhoods in this section of the border. The Boca de Lobo, the Wolf's Mouth, is at the base of the mountains where the trains have to slow down before they ascend. It's literally a stone's throw from the tracks, making it the perfect place for thieves to snap up cargo. From his informants, Larry knew when there was a valuable train coming into the yard, one with flat screen TVs or Nike shoes. And if his fellow rail cops were too busy at the Circle K, Larry had a plan. 
So we were talking about source development and the FBI was telling you how I had more informants than they did. Big government agencies don't get involved unless the thefts are large enough, and some are at the Book of the Lobo. So Larry developed allies and other agencies. Larry told me about the setup for one of his big raids. You see the highest point of the first hill in front of us right here? So we used to set up in that saddle. Everybody was involved, the Phoebes, the, the, the Customs, the uh, Railroad Police, Border Patrol, Sun and Park Police Department. We used to set up over there at night, 10 o'clock till, you know, 6 a.m. while it was dark. We had Black Hawks and night vision and everything. Once the guys were in place, Larry would command the operation from up in the saddle. As from Border Patrol, I mean, they'd dig themselves a hole, maybe two days before, low crawl all the way across through the bushes, dressed like a damn bush themselves. They went in there with their little shovels and get in the dirt and cover themselves up and they lived there for 12 hours. Yeah, eating, shit in their pants, peed in their pants, just so they wouldn't be found out and, you know, discovered. From the saddle, the force had a great view of the train's route through the wolf's mouth. As a train approaches, everyone is in position. Up next, how the raid unfolds. During the summer of 2020, some Americans suspected that the FBI had secretly infiltrated the racial justice demonstrations. And you know what? They were right. I'm Trevor Aronson, and I'm hosting a new podcast series, Alphabet Boys. As the FBI, sometimes you gotta grab the little guy to go after the big guy. Each season will take you inside an undercover investigation. In the first season of Alphabet Boys, we're revealing how the FBI spied on protesters in Denver. At the center of this story is a raspy-voiced, cigar-smoking man who drives a silver hearse. And inside this hearse was like a lot of guns. He's a shark, and not in the good, badass way. He's a, a nasty shark. He was just waiting for me to set the date, the time, and then for sure he was trying to get it to happen. Listen to Alphabet Boys on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lance Bass, and you may know me from a little band called NSYNC. What you may not know is that when I was 23, I traveled to Moscow to train to become the youngest person to go to space. And when I was there, as you can imagine, I heard some pretty wild stories. But there was this one that really stuck with me, about a Soviet astronaut who found himself stuck in space with no country to bring him down. It's 1991, and that man, Sergei Krekalev, is floating in orbit when he gets a message that down on Earth, his beloved country, the Soviet Union, is falling apart. And now he's left defending the Union's last outpost. This is the crazy story of the 313 days he spent in space. 313 days that changed the world. Listen to The Last Soviet on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's 1967, the Cold War, and Joseph Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, the princess of the Kremlin, has just fled Mother Russia. Her new home? A place where the roads are paved with gold and people bake apple pies out of baseballs and freedom. A place called America. Hello to everybody. I am very happy to be here. That story alone would be worthy of a podcast. But this one, Svetlana Svetlana, is about what comes next. And it's the craziest story I've ever heard. It has KGB agents, mystics, and a Frank Lloyd Wright commune, destiny, immortality, and unbreakable cycles, weird sex stuff, weird money stuff, weird dances, three Olgas, two Svetlanas, and one neurotic gay playwright who won't shut up about it all. Guess which one I am? Listen to Svetlana Svetlana on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. With the train tracks running right by the border, the Boca de Lobo was the perfect place for thieves to strike. Judging from the 
So what's in that train? Is everything. It- everything you can possibly think of from makeup to, I mean, everything. Shoes, clothing, food. I mean, anything you can think of. Probably- and all those goods were vulnerable in this stretch of desert. After driving in fast from the west, trains slowed down right by the border as they approached El Paso to climb Mount Cristo Rey. So the railroad police out here would have a hell of a time because the trains, as I was saying, would go up the hill, a mile and a half long train. But these trains are now two and three miles long, offering a lot of cargo theft opportunities. So no matter how many street gang and cargo theft informants Joe and Larry had, the trains were vulnerable. And from up in the saddle, Larry could see the whole thing play out. The train would only be going 20 miles an hour or whatever. And believe it or not, yes, these guys can jump on a train while it was moving at 20, 25 miles an hour without any problem. Hopping a train moving at 20 miles an hour is no joke. But these experienced thieves had no problem. They just knew how to time it. They would jump on it and grab onto a ladder. And they did it sometimes with 20, 30, 40, 50 pound backpacks on their back full of dope. Once that first group hopped on a train, the next step was to make it stop. They would pull out the pins to make the train lose its air. The train would stop, and these guys would come across 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, maybe even 40 would come and start looting the train. And then it was an all-or-nothing free-for-all. The thieves cracked open containers as easily as they had hopped the train. And they would come with bolt cutters. Some of them just had pipes that fit around the high security seals and they would just work it back and forth until it broke off and they open up the container and they'd have like six or seven, 10, 15 guys there and they would just start unloading. Incredibly, sometimes the robbery was even simpler than that. I mean, why bother stopping the train at all? They would burglarize the train as it moved also. They said, you know what, I need to go to El Paso. I'm going to burglarize the train as it's moving and get some stuff and then go sell it downtown, and it's a win-win for them. They get a free ride, they get their product, and they sell it, they make their money, et cetera, et cetera. So as the train nears the Boca de Lobo, cargo thieves emerge from the Mexican side of the border, and the whole operation commences. The Blackhawks swoop down, lights scan the tracks, swarms of officers pop out of the bushes, and dozens of cargo thieves are hauled off to jail. But despite all this, despite all the fancy equipment and the government budgets, Larry and his team weren't able to make much of a dent in things. You know what, we weren't very successful. They, they just, they, this is their neighborhood, this is their territory. They were in full control. The thieves knew the area and were experienced at avoiding detection. And these train robberies were a sophisticated operation. We didn't have what it took to catch them. Yeah, we caught a bunch of them a lot of times, but we didn't catch them as much as I think we should have. They were just quicker than us. They were desperate. I mean, they, they, they wanted to eat. They wanted to get high. They were motivated. How could Joe and Larry ever wrap their arms around all this chaos? They could turn informants, pull in Phoebe's, bring in the Blackhawks. At the end of the day, they were outnumbered. But even if Larry didn't make a big dent in the cargo theft in El Paso, bringing in those government agencies was significant. Here was a rail cop leading a multi-agency government raid. History left rail cops with overarching powers, and for Larry, that meant a chance to climb from L.A. Sheriff's Department training to commanding the FBI, thanks, in part, to the railroads. And from his perch in the saddle, Larry was the king of the hill able to use all of his colorful background on the job, and he'd certainly shown those guys who called him a diversity hire. Running this raid, Larry felt powerful, and like he was making an impact at least. He felt so good, nothing could bring him down. Even the fact that the residents of the Boca de Lobo were not Jimi Hendrix fans. I learned Mexican music because I sat up there so long. I would, the words, and I would listen to the words, and I'd be up there tapping my toe, rocking out, listening to music that they were playing down here, because it was the same, you know, 30 songs, you know, day after day. And they was loud, and they would all gather. It'd be like, you know, 20, 30, 40 of them out here dancing, laughing. You can hear girls giggling, and you gunfire, and it's just crazy. Larry's teammates would look up using their night vision goggles and wonder what Larry was doing up there. They would be on this mesa up here, and they would see me over there. And they go, Tia, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm dancing. Dog, he's not answering because he's dancing right now. He's rocking out. <laughs> and I would. They go, hey, they're going to see you, man. No, fucker, they ain't got night vision. I can't even see the guy sitting two feet away from me. How are they going to see me? 
to yell, lay back down, shut up, this is my operation, I'm gonna dance if I want to. Larry was dancing, because even though he didn't stop cargo theft, through this raid, he could get a piece that brought him closer to solving this puzzle. By capturing thieves and interrogating them, Larry might get information not just about cargo theft, but about drug smuggling. These smugglers find every which way they can to smuggle narcotics in the U.S. Because I knew about Tucson, I knew about Phoenix, I knew about L.A., I knew about, you know, east and west of here, a hundred miles, several hundred miles, and then they ride with the load to, like, uh, they'll end up going in the end to Chicago or whatever. And it happens, too, on the way going south. We're always looking for money in rail cars going back south into Mexico. This smuggling network reaches everywhere the railroads do. But when we talk about illegal immigration and drug smuggling, somehow the trains rarely come up. In fact, when I asked Larry to characterize the extent of the problem, he didn't mince words. I will tell you, every train's got it. Every single train that comes across has got some contraband. Not just narcotics, but like even merchandise that has not been cleared by customs and they're sneaking it across because customs would delay it or it costs too much to bring it across. Absolutely no doubt. Every single train. This might sound like a bold claim at first, but it happens in plain sight on the Mexican side of the border. Alexi, who I spoke with in episode three, told me about riding a train through the state of Chihuahua, where Juarez is. He decided to hop a train home to Texas. After finding his way to the tracks, Alexi was surprised to discover that in Mexico, train hopping is not a crime. It takes place out in the open. At whatever time at night, the the ground crew is like, Chihuahua, Chihuahua, just yelling it out. And then all these people that I didn't even see that were in the bushes all loaded up on the train at once. I mean, they were all up on top of grainers. I mean, it was probably like 30-something people on this train. So I get on the train, and, and I remember being either a full moon or real close to a full moon. With his new companions on the train, Alexi moved through one of the most beautiful landscapes he'd ever seen, Chihuahua's Copper Canyon. I was riding the train through Copper Canyon, which is just spectacularly gorgeous. And I I remember the moon reflecting on ponds and, and lakes and just so, so gorgeous. Lulled by the beauty, Alexi was surprised when the train began to slow and then stop. He saw a dust cloud in the distance, And then he got a close-up view of the drug trade from the Mexican side of the border. And that dust pile gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And this train, right before it stops, people busted the locks on the top of the grainers and then took out bales, hay bale size of weed. Just bales and bales and bales of weed. And then that, that dust that plume that I saw in the background was a truck that was rendezvousing. This weed wasn't crossing the border in the train, but the train was bringing it closer. So smaller amounts could be smuggled across using other methods of transport like vans or backpacks. And then they just dumped all this weed on the side of the, side of the train. And then probably about, say, like 10 people or something like that all got off and loaded up that truck and burned off. (laughs) Alexi witnessed a smuggling operation pulled off without a hitch. In and out. Easy. It was just a normal routine thing. The engineer must have been in in on it. You know, like, everybody was in on it. Speaking with Alexi, it's hard not to sympathize with Larry. He had Joe. He had government resources. But in the end, he was another cop fighting against a challenge that has thousands of people on the other side. No matter how hard Larry worked, the problem of cargo theft was going on before he got there and still goes on now that he's gone. But at the end of the day, it never has been, and never will be, the railroad's top priority. When the Border Patrol confiscated drugs smuggled on Union Pacific trains, it issued heavy fines to try to encourage the railroad to get better control of its business. But Union Pacific maintained that it couldn't control what was placed on its trains in Mexico. After all, it has no jurisdiction in a foreign country. Surely the government could understand that. How could Union Pacific forget that it owns 24% of Faro Mex, the same railroad that brings Union Pacific cargo over the border to El Paso? 
That was another dimension to my understanding of the rails. Sure, I knew about the risks of the train and the hobos, but smugglers and thieves, that was something else. Yet again, this world remains hidden in plain sight. Trains thread their way through all sorts of terrible neighborhoods and crime-infested industrial sites, and no one thinks of them as the connectors of one crime scene to another. And there was Ruby, making her way through it all. I was exhausted when I got back from El Paso. It was something about learning how the rail cops operated that made me think maybe I'd had my fill of the darkness. Like when Joe described young women in the train yard bargaining for their safety. Maybe I didn't need to know that. Yet there is that maternal obligation to worry and to convince yourself that worrying is a form of love. If I wasn't doing this mad investigation, running around the country, talking to hundreds of people, was I giving up hope? Was I abandoning Ruby? So it was in my state of frustrated energy that Ruby called. I was still unpacking my stuff in my room at the barn, but the first thing I had put together was my desk my reporting station for collecting info about what was going on with Ruby. So when my cell phone rang, I sat down and pulled out my Ruby notebook to jot down the number she was calling from. But the second she started talking, I realized I wouldn't need my notebook. Ruby told me she was coming home. She would take her time, but she was on her way back. When she left, part of her goal, she'd had a goal, was to see the United States. On her way home, she would circumnavigate the nation, starting in New York with a visit to her brother, then up to Vermont and across the top of the country. She had no idea how long it would take, but I didn't care. There was an end date, date uncertain, but there was an end. So just as I was about to surrender, this brought me back. There was a problem with all that I had learned. Instead of some soothing image of Ruby in the boxcar gazing at fields of grain, I could actually imagine the steps it took to hop a train, the dangers in the boxcar, and the scary people in and near the yard. Maybe my time in the city of the rails was coming to an end with Ruby's return, but there was just one more story I wanted to get before I left. It was a story about the people who run the city of the rails. It was about the workers. In the train yard, the power of the railroad works in the favor of the rail cops, but often that power doesn't serve the rest of its employees well. When I'd been in Colton, I went to a retirement party where I met Carrie Westcott. The guests were all congratulating themselves for having made it all the way to retirement because so few do. And then one of them said, it was a shame what they did to Nikki. And another one said, it should be illegal, but it's just the way of the railroad. So who was Nikki? Nikki's just one of those people that you just always want to do more for. She's just such a good person, you know, and just has such a good energy. They didn't like Nikki. Nikki carries herself in a way that they don't like the alpha male, black or female. And everybody knows once Union Pacific puts their claws in you, they're not going to stop until they can terminate you. Like I used to say on Norfolk Southern, I said, we hate them. And the reason we hate them is because they hate us. Nobody treats other human beings in the way that we are being treated unless they actually hate us. Next, we'll look into the relationship between those who drive the trains and those who own them and how it got to be this way. That's next episode on City of the Rails. City of the Rails is written and hosted by me, Danelle Morton, and developed in partnership between Flip Turn Studios and iHeart Podcasts. Thank you to everyone who's been calling us. I'm hearing from housewives, artists, current hobos, and retired ones. It's great when a story can touch so many different people. We love to hear it, so please keep calling. The number is 707-653-0339. Want to help us out? You can do it very quickly by leaving us a rating or a review wherever you're listening to this. It will help more people find the show, and it means a lot to us. Want to follow along? Find us on Instagram at FlipTurnPods. 
Our team is executive producer and showrunner Julian Weller and executive producer Mark Healy from Flip Turn. Senior producer and editing master Abu Zafar. And producers Sheena Ozaki and Zoe Denkla. Shout out to the Lady Squad. It's just Zoe and me now that Emily and Sheena have gone on to other shows. But we have new recruits, Trisha Mukherjee and Jackie Huntington. Thanks for stepping in. Production support from Marcy DePina. Original music every episode by Aaron Kaufman. I was so honored that Aaron wrote music for this show. Those intriguing themes when I'm describing a dark part of the train yard, or the light ironic ones when something unexpectedly funny is going down, that's all Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, for your deft touch and your occasional editorial advice. You're a truth teller who doesn't blink, in addition to being a very talented composer. Our theme music for this episode is Warrants in Texas, performed by Barefoot Surrender. Our logo is by Lucy Quintanilla and uses a photograph by Mike Brody. Thank you to the Nation Institute for Investigative Journalism and the George Polk Foundation for their generous grants in support of my reporting on the rail cops. I got these grants more than 10 years ago, which shows just how hard it is to report this story. And I'm not done yet. Any rail cops who want to give me a call, you've got my number. And at iHeart, thanks to Nikki Etor and Beth Ann Mecaluso. We'll be back next week in Colton, because I cannot get enough of Colton, on City of the Rails. Did you know Lance Bass is a Russian-trained astronaut? That he went through training in a secret facility outside Moscow, hoping to become the youngest person to go to space? Well, I ought to know, because I'm Lance Bass. And I'm hosting a new podcast that tells my crazy story and an even crazier story about a Russian astronaut who found himself stuck in space with no country to bring him down. With the Soviet Union collapsing around him, He orbited the Earth for 313 days that changed the world. Listen to The Last Soviet on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, y'all? I'm Guillermo Diaz, and I played Huck on Scandal. And I'm Katie Lowe's, a.k.a. Quinn Perkins, and we're the hosts of Unpacking the Toolbox, the Scandal Rewatch podcast where we're talking about all the best moments of the show. With guests like Tony Goldwyn, who always amped up the fire as President Fitzgerald Grant. Grab your Scandal swag, your dubele, and join us on Unpacking the Toolbox every Thursday. Listen to Unpacking the Toolbox on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcast. Alphabet Boys is a new podcast series that goes inside undercover investigations. In the first season, we're diving into an FBI investigation of the 2020 protests. It involves a cigar smoking mystery man who drives a silver hearse. And inside this hearse was like a lot of guns. But are federal agents catching bad guys or creating them? He was just waiting for me to set the date, the time, and then for sure he was trying to get it to happen. Listen to Alphabet Boys on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.